We continue on with the sermon I started three weeks ago. And the sermon's entitled, God Expects More Than Just Getting By. To summarize real quick, I left off last week, you don't have to turn to it. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. So Jesus says, so he called ten of his servants and gave them ten dollars. And he said, put this money, this treasure to work until I return. And I left off last week talking about there's no time off when you become a Christian. There's no days off. There's no days where you set aside your Christianity and you decide to live your life the way you want to. It's an absolute place to surrender. It's a place where you give up. And I can tell you in 40 years of serving the Lord, there have been many times I've tried to go opposite of what I just said. Probably I'm the only one in this room that's ever wanted to do that. But I, I'm going to be honest with you, it's a battle. And it's a battle that you will fight till the day you take that last breath or until the return of Jesus comes. But I'm going to tell you something. You hang in there. Because the greatest reward of all is to know that one day when you stand before the Lord, the Father's going to take a look at you. The Son of God's going to leave the right hand of the Father, come and stand alongside you, put his arm around you. And the Father's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into thy rest. And all this stuff that we worry about down here, all this stuff that goes on every single day that we think is so vitally important, will all be gone in a flash, in a blink of an eye. And the most important thing that any of us can do is continue to live out our lives. And God expects more from us than just getting by. And what's disturbing to me, and that's why part of this has really come out, what's disturbing to me is the, 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 the I don't want to call it the value of Christianity today. Maybe that's what I want to call it. It's just the status quo. It's just, yeah, I'm a Christian, and I'm just going to be a Christian. But we have no, absolutely no impact on the world around us. When you look around and you see a world that's lost, and maybe a lot of Christians don't want to see the world that's lost around them. I can honestly tell you that the firehouse here at the firehouse, that's what we look at. We look at people and we try to look past sometimes the most aggravating things in people's lives because there's something inside of them that is dying and lost, and that's what the focus should be. And that's how we as Christians, those who have been lost or are now found, those who were blind but now see, that should be the focus of our lives, is to be able to look at a world that is lost and dying and realize that we will do whatever it takes to know that they will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's got to be a passion that burns inside of any person that calls himself a Christian. That's not popular in Christianity today because Christians just want to call themselves Christian, do their own Christian things, have their own Christian world, and let the world go to hell in a handbasket. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's what God wants from us. Here's where we pick up today. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. I'm going to talk really fast because I'm really hoping I get done with this today. So Philippians chapter 3, verse number 13. And I've entitled this part of this message, Give It Your All. Let me read this scripture to you. Philippians 3.13 reads as this. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Verse number 14. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You know, it's not uncommon for new Christians, I love watching new Christians, to not hold anything back. I love watching new Christians, they jump into it with both feet and they're, all, they're forgiven. They, I, I still remember the moment I accepted Christ and I, forget, I remember at that, that particular moment just a freedom flooding my heart. I remember a tear falling down my face. I remember the moment that I got up from the side of my bed and I knew something had changed in me. And I went out and I began to tell the world about what Christ had done in my life. And yeah, probably I needed to dial it back because everybody was going to hell and I was the only one going to heaven and that was my job to tell them that. <laughs> and I'm grateful that there were older Christians, not stagnant Christians, older mature Christians who still had a zeal for the Lord that kind of took me under their arm and go, yo, Steve, <laughs> uh, dial it down a little bit. And they explained to me that words were just words, but a life change would be eternal. And the reason I specify between older, mature Christians and not stagnant Christians is there's a huge difference. I want to be around older, mature Christians who have walked the faith. I've said this before. I want to be around people that got scars, man. I want to be around people that their kneecaps are worn off because of prayer. The stagnant ones are the ones that just like walking around calling themselves a Christian and they're, they're, they complain about everything. 
Music's too loud, it's too soft, it's too rocky, not rocky. We need more hymns. We don't need any hymns. Blah, 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 blah. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Those people, get away from me. I don't even like being around you. Get me the, ugh, the yeebs. You know what I'm saying? But I love what this scripture talks about. And, and let, let me finish this thought, though. New Christians, I get something. Instant sanctification, which means cleaning up your life, does happen in some occasions. I know the very first thing in my life when I accepted Jesus Christ that left me was my vulgar language. That was the first thing that came out of my life was swearing it was gone. But there was other things that took time. And there's other things 40 years later that are still taking time. But the fact of the matter is, I continue to go before the Lord and ask God to, to, to change me and to mold me and to shape me. But it's interesting, you know, this, the thing is that there should be a change in all of our lives. And I'm more of a progressive sanctification kind of guy. I believe in giving grace to those who are new Christians. And the longer, older you get, and the more mature you should be getting, you shouldn't be doing the same things you did the day you accepted Jesus Christ. There should be a changing that goes on in your life. And there, that changing comes because there's a desire to know and please God more. But in this passage right here, Paul is talking and he says, Brothers and sisters, and this is the hope, please hear this. Because I think, I, I love Paul. I, he's one of my favorite guys out of the Bible. And I want to look forward to meeting him when I get up to heaven. I just want to sit and talk with him and just listen to this guy. Because I love reading the words that he wrote. And he, this was a huge hope. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Any of you ever feel like that? He wrote how much of the New Testament? A third of it or two-thirds of it? He wrote a lot of the New Testament. God saw him worthy enough to write, to pen the words that are in our New Testament. And yet Paul looks at everybody and says, you know, I don't got all the answers. And I'm not hitting the ball 100% of the time. What I like about him and what I get out of Scripture, at least he's stepping up to the plate and swinging. He says, I haven't taken hold of it yet. But, see, a lot of people use that as an excuse. You know, I just, I, it, it's just not working in me yet. It's just, you know, because uh, we all throw out our heritage. Even though, you know, I'm a third generation Italian, I think. Great-grandparents, right? Great-grandparents and dad. So would that make me fourth generation? I've never been to Italy. Never been there. People ask me what I am, Italian. I don't even know. I, I know Italy's over there somewhere. It looks like a boot. <laughs> but we all claim it. I, I'm loud because I'm Italian. No, I'm probably loud from all the years of work construction with all, all the, 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 the thing. And my mother was very loud. And I think I was deaf from a child. But uh, we all claim it. You, you got a temper? Everybody claims a temper. I'm Irish. I can't help it. Or I'm, or I'm a, wait. I'm a hard head. Is that German? German? Okay. Uh, what, what else? We, we, I should just open this up. This could, cre this could create something. Uh, Dutch, what are they known for? Not much. No! <laughs> John! <laughs> See, that's, we'll, we'll stop right there. We'll, we'll stop right there. Okay. <laughs> John O'Meara at... <laughs> yeah, that was a bad idea. But anyway... We all claim something like it's an excuse for why we are the way we are. But this is what Paul says. But one thing I do, I forget what is behind me. I forget what's behind me. Look at me. How many of you are allowing your past to ruin your future? How many of you? How many of you are looking at that past and looking at that thing you did or the things you did in your life before Christ or maybe even in your life after Christ but where you fell and you keep going right back there? You know who's taking you right back there? The enemy. The enemy's taking you right back to that grave site and he wants you to stand there and stare at that grave site. I don't go to grave sites. I've never been back to my sister's mausoleum. She's been dead f uh, 35 years. I've never been, oh, my mom's up in the attic. Dad, I've never been to, to his. <laughs> Uh, I have seen her because when we get the Christmas stuff out, she's right over there in the set. But, you know, I, but I, it's not like I talk to her. <laughs> well, sometimes I do. Hey, Mom, what's up? <laughs> Look a little dusty. But uh, uh, 
I know, it's terrible. I have a weird view on death, I know. But <laughs> write me. <laughs> C.trolio at yahoo.com. <laughs> uh, so, what was I talking about? <laughs> yes. I don't go to grave sites. I don't go, they're not there. I don't go there. I know people that do and they spend their life at grave sites. Dude, they're gone. And you know what the devil does? He takes us right back to the grave site. Takes us right back to go, hey, look what you did. Look what you've done. People come into, do you know why people come into church the way they do? Maybe why you came in today, kind of like, uh, is because you're carrying, you, you're standing at the grave site. The only grave site I want to stand next to is that empty tomb. That's the only one I, I want to go see. I want to go see the napkin folded, meaning he'll never be back there. That's what I, the only, only grave site I want to go to is his, because he ain't there. And the thing is that Paul says, forgetting, I forget. I forget what is behind me. And the reason I forget what's behind me, I love this word, straining towards what is ahead of me. Straining. You ever see a baseball player? None of Chicago. But do you ever see a baseball player? Have you ever seen a football player? As a ball is hit and they completely outstretch. I love, you know, watching uh, the, the, the slow motion. When you see these athletes that are completely horizontal to the ground and every ounce of them is flexed out that is what Paul says I am stretching I am straining towards that goal they are doing that because they want to catch a little white ball they want to catch on the New England side a deflated football <laughs> that nobody knew about Steelers we add two extra pounds to ours He says, I strain towards what ahead. Verse 14, I press. I press on towards the goal. Straining and pressing. People don't like to strain and people don't like to press. They like to be lumps. They like to just be lumps. I'm a Christian. Yippee. My goal is to just get to heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's where I want to go. Bless the Lord. I'll give my $20 in the offering and call it tithe. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe say hello to my neighbor, but I'll never tell them I'm a Christian. What if they don't like me? Hooey. That's a theological word for caca. <laughs> no, seriously, we, we need our butts kicked, folks. We're in such a, a lax, complacent, vomit-stinking state in Christianity today in the United States. And again, maybe I'm still feeling, you know, people are, oh, he's still feeling the effects of the uh, missions trip. No, the parasite's out. <laughs> it's gone. It, it waved its glass goodbye the other day. I'm like, so long. <laughs> Okay, maybe it hasn't. <laughs> I didn't do, don't look at me like I did that. You're like, oh, look what Pastor Steve did. I was talking about a parasite, not about your guitar. Do you got to go look at it? No, you're just going to, you're just, you're just, you're just going to cry from there. I'm sorry. We'll take a minute. You need a minute? All right. But you know what? He says, I press on towards the goal. What's the goal? To win the prize for which God has called me heavenly word to Christ Jesus. What's the prize? To know him more. To know him more. Here's something. Our lives change as we go on. We should mature in the Lord. We should allow his sanctification process to take hold of him in our hearts. And the things that we once saw important that were, weren't important, we should strive towards the things that are. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, let me read this to you, verse number 23. It, this, is, this is something we have to determine to do. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to sanctify us completely through and through. 
He wants to get to every square inch of our being with his Holy Spirit. But the thing about God's Spirit, it will only be allowed to go where we allow it to go. If we shut an area off, God will never bust down the door to get in that area. Because we will always be able to go back and say, the only reason you went there is you kicked the door down. And God has given us free will, and he, well, the only way he'll get in is when we say, Lord, I surrender that part of my life to you. Come in and cut it out. Change it. Clean it. Whatever you have to do, come in there and take care of business. Now the next part, number four. You can't do this on your own. But you don't have to. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. You can't do this on your own. A lot of people try to live their Christianity on their own. But they'll fail. I've said this before. One of the most heartbreaking things for Cher and I watching in ministry is people that come to church, get to know Christ. We see their attendance going well at church. And then they start to miss a Sunday. And then, you know, a few weeks later, they miss another Sunday. And then they maybe miss two in a row. And then maybe three in a row. And you just watch and begin to just fade off. And you're like, oh, no, church isn't important. Shut up. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And when people say to me, I'm a Christian, but I don't have to go to church, I just, can I tell you, I'll be honest, I want to grab them by the throat. I want to grab them by the throat and cast a demon right out of them. And say, be gone. Because I tell you what, this is important. This is important. What we did in worship is important. What we did in prayer is important. What we gave in our tithes and offering is important. What we're doing now is important. What we do after the message is done is important. This is needed in your life, in my life. But you don't have to do this on your own. Now, let me read real quick. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in myself. Everybody's like, yeah, that's, sure. No, look at what the scripture says. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live. It's Christ that lives in me. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you died. You died. And it's no longer your life that's, that, that you have the right to live. It's you live his life in you. We are to draw near to Christ, not to walk away from him. We are to draw near to God every day. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me say this to you, and I'll probably repeat it somewhere written in here. If there's anything in your life that's distracting you from drawing near to God, you have a choice. Embrace it or cut it out of your life. And the choice is yours. The choice is mine. You embrace it, you've made your call. You've made your call by saying, Lord, this is more important than you are. If you cut it out of your life, you've made your call. You say, Lord, you're the most important thing in my life. For he says here, the life I now live in the body, this, I live by faith in the Son of God. And this is the part that should grip your soul. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Does that move you? You don't have to answer that out loud. Does that, does that move you? Does that move you that the thought that the Son of God died for you all because he loved you? I, I mean, also, I've said this before. That's what moved my heart. Fear hell, there was no fear. Fear of man, there was no fear. This moved my heart. Because he loved me. And he loves me to this day. 
And he gave himself freely for my life, ransoming my, his life for mine. We have become so hardened in our Christianity and our faith in this thing called faith in the United States that we fail to see this. We go to seminars that teach about this and teach about that, which is perfectly fine. And people get moved by all sorts of things. But if this isn't at the core, I'm going to say this, if this is not at the core of your heart, being shifted away from sin to God, there is a deep concern for where your salvation roots go to. Because many people sign on to faith in God for a lot of different reasons. One is for a fire insurance. One is so that they can get out of a sticky situation. One so that they can impress somebody to get near them. Oh, there's a lot of different reasons why people come to know Christ. We're watching the, uh, the Bible, the what's your AD thing. And if you guys haven't seen that, you ought to take a look at it. It's, it's been really good. It's, I think we've watched, what, eight or nine of them? And right now, they're still, what we're, we are, we're still in the book of Acts. And it, it was, we watched last week about um, Saul, who became Paul on the road to Damascus, being converted by Christ appearing to him. But the part that I liked, too, was about Simon the sorcerer. And I don't know if any of you know the story in Acts, but Simon the so sorcerer, or sorcerer, however you want to say it from wherever you're from, um, you know, he wanted to be baptized. He wanted to accept Christ. It's, he said he did. And then he wanted to give Peter some money because he wasn't able to do what they were doing. He said, well, how much do I have to give you so I can do what you do? See, a lot of people do that. I've known people that have accepted Christ so they can land a business deal. Yeah. And I've stuck, taken a step back and go, dude, you're going to burn in hell, man. Oh, you might have money, but you're going to burn, baby. You need to repent. If your heart hasn't been shifted by the fact that he loves you and gave himself for you, you need to go back to where you started. And you need to let this part of your life change. Look at me. As long as you got breath in your lungs, there's still hope for you. Don't walk out of here going, I'm a hopeless dirt bag. <laughs> there's still hope. But you got to do something about it. Listen, our lives become a temple for God to dwell. Hear this. A building... A building doesn't make a church. Hear me. A building doesn't make a church. Amen. It's the body of believers that make a church. It's God's spirit coming that makes a church. And again, we are so focused all the time about it's got to be a building and then we'll be a church. We're confused. It's the body that fills the church that makes the church. <coughs> And our lives become that way. We become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And our lives are no longer our own. So we don't have to do this on our own. And I, I know people disagree with this. And I really don't care. But I believe with all my heart. And I can prove. I'm not a, uh, one of those thinker peoples. Uh, you know the philosopher peoples. Philosopher. Philosophy. You know those peoples. I, I'm not, don't, I, if you're going to talk to me about stuff. Like big stuff like stuff that nobody cares about but you, um, don't talk to me. I, I don't care. I, but I can tell you something. 40 years I've been serving Christ. And in 40 years I've had a lot of questions in my life. And I can stand here and tell you that this book has answered every question that I've ever had in my entire life. And that's what it's supposed to be for. I don't need to go to some think tank. I don't need to go to some other guy's book. This book has the answers for my life. And this book has the answers for your life. So you're not on your own. Fifth one. It is possible. Know this. When we are just existing instead of living out what God has for our lives, hear this, it's our fault and not his. 
it is our fault and not his when we're just merely existing. Let, let me cite an example to you. You know, many times we take offering. Well, every week we take an offering, and I tell you always to pray. When we take a special offering, I tell you ahead of time, and I always tell you make sure you pray. And I always tell you to seek God. Now, don't answer this out loud. How many of you ever, God has ever spoken to and said to give this amount? And you're like, that's impossible, and you've gone to the lower amount. Just saying, that's an example. That's a tangible example for any of us to see. What, God, that, that must have been the pizza I ate last night telling me to give this much because I couldn't possibly give that much. I just talked to Senor Tony yesterday. Uh, he, he was wounded again, sent me a picture, blood all over the roof, it was about that big. And uh, because last time we were there with him, not this trip, the trip before he cut his hand and what, three stitches he got? But by the time the trip was done, he was at 35 or 36 stitches in his hand, it was horrible. So he sent me the picture of the blood on the roof and then he sent me a picture of a Band-Aid on his finger. Uh, so, he, and he wrote 125 stitches, which is amazing that you can put 100. But uh, so I spoke to uh, Senor Tony yesterday and, and, you know, rainy season's coming. So guys, they, they in church and uh, Leah's at the firehouse, but tell Leo she's part of uh, They poured the other part of the roof that we didn't get to finish, which is awesome. They poured the second floor roof in San Juanito, which is um, the first church that we built. They poured a roof in Compostela over the bathrooms and stuff. That was the second church that we built. They poured that, so they're getting everything all buttoned up for rainy season. And he told me yesterday that San Juanito, which is in the middle of a slum, pretty much, it's in a very low, low income area there, um, that somebody gave $5,000. Not somebody up here, somebody from there gave the church, which is considered over 50,000 pesos, gave $5,000 to that church so that they could finish things before the rainy season comes. They're able to put the windows in. They're able to pour the roof. They're able to put the doors on. Now, for some, that might not seem like a lot of money. You put that up here, and that's probably easily twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars somebody gave because they said, you know what? They had prayed, and God had shown them, and they gave in faith. See, we become so comfortable that we lay back, we pull back. Maybe God's prompting you to talk to that person that you work with, and just let them know that there's somebody praying for them, and you keep putting that aside. Like ah, that can't be God. That person's a jerk. If I go and tell them that I'm praying for them, they're going to cuss me out. And we, day after day, week after week goes by and you never say anything to them. Maybe it's God prompting your heart. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. We're not doing this on our own. And we can't give up. We can't get lackadaisical about it. And listen to this. So what, we, what do we do to combat, combat the, the, the feeling or the idea that we're just going to get by? Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2. Turn to it. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2. This is Paul's final instruction to the Colos church. Uh, 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 here, it's his final instruction. Any of you ever give final instructions? I mean, not like you're going to die because you're here. But, uh, you know, anytime I leave, you know, and go somewhere, I, or I'm going to be gone, I'll say something to Cheer, or Cheer and I will say to the kids, okay, if we leave, here's the envelope with all our death stuff in there. If we die, here it is. It's entitled, just in case of you know what happens. <laughs> and they're like, we don't want to talk about it. I'm like, it's there, there it is. Cheer's like, are you sure we're doing the right thing? They're grown adults. They'll figure it out. Let, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be okay. They really will. But if you ever give, you're going, you give a final instruction, you emphasize something just in case you don't see them again. Right? Chira was always blown away in our family. Our family was very dysfunctional. My, my family was very dysfunctional. We, I mean, there could be a war going on in our house, literally. But before one of us leave, would leave the house, we were always told we had to tell anybody in the house that we loved them. My mom could be cussing me out, throwing beer bottles at me, and it's time for me to go to school, 
And before I'd go to school, I'd say, I love you, Mom. I love you too, son. Be careful. Uh, now, I guess for some people, that's weird. I, uh, she tried to run me over one time with the car. I jumped out of the way. She went right through the front of our house, right through the picture window. Later on, after the bricklayers were there to re-brick and, and put board over, and they towed the car out of the front of the house, I had to go somewhere. I said, love you, Mom. Love you too, son. Well, again, some people think that's weird. <laughs> we just found it perfectly normal. The night my older sister and her husband left, I said, I love you, Laura. She goes, I love you too. And a few hours later, she died in my arms. I don't know, maybe we're just weird that way. But it's like a final instruction. Paul's giving a final instruction to this church. And listen, he could say anything. And this is what he says. Devote yourselves to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. Now here's a guy that penned almost all of the New Testament. And here's this church. And he could have told them anything. But he looks at him and says, devote yourselves to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. Let me hurry and here we go. Christians, churches, would be so much more powerful if we would just do exactly what Paul says. Let me break it down. Prayer is a must. Prayer is a must. I'm always after my leaders. In fact, I'm going to be after my leaders again today. They're going to get an email. Nine o'clock, we have prayer. Nine o'clock, we pray for this service. Not 9.02, not 9.15, 9 a.m., we pray for this. And every one of my leaders came to me and said, I want to be part of the leadership team. And I always said to them, you're asking me, I'm not asking you. Prayer is a must for a church. Prayer is a must for individuals. If you're going to live out a life in this lost and dying world, prayer can't be an option. It can't be, ooh, I forgot to pray. Oh, Lord, now I'll lay me down and sleep. All my peanuts at my feet. If I die before I wake, I don't know the rest of the prayer. It can't be an afterthought. It has to be the first thought. I'm just, you understand, this is so to help you. Help us. Help us. Help all of us. And to do this better. i got to hurry. Prayer, effective prayer, oh, can't be an afterthought. I kind of said it. Prayer must be, oh, here's a word, deliberate. Deliberate. Note, oh, that's for me. There are, yes, spontaneous prayers where you just pray spontaneously. But the prayer I'm talking about is the prayer where you and God get down to business. When was the last time you and God got down to business? When was the last time you and God got together face to face and you suck carpet? When was the last time? Well, I've never done that. <laughs> I don't know what that means. What it means is you get alone with God. Sucking carpet is mean you put your face on the carpet. Now, if you're injured, you don't have to get on the floor. Just sit in a chair. But you and God get to get alone. Quick. Next part says being watchful. Now, why would he say that? Be devoted to prayer and being watchful. Why being watchful? What? Watchful of what? Anything that brings distraction between you and God. Anything that brings distraction between you and God, be watchful. If it's taking your eyes off of him, cut it out. Cut it out of your life. He's saying being watchful. People today are blind. Christians today are blind. They're not being watchful. They're not watching the horizon. The new, I, I heard the other day, and I gotta hurry. The, I heard the other day, there, there was a book that came out years ago. It's called The Prayer of, J, Prayer of Jabez. Good little book, prayer book about the prayer of Jabez, who was this dude from the Old Testament, was always, you know, like a down kind of guy, but prayed this prayer, and, and God blessed him because he was honest. Well, church after church after church started teaching it and started saying, this was the prayer of Jabez. You pray this prayer exactly how it is, and God will do exactly what he did for Jabez. You just pray it exactly how it's said. And people taught seminars, and they taught Sunday school lessons, and they did all this stuff about prayer of Jabez. And I told her, what an abomination before God. Because people were reading that prayer, not as the prayer of, of Jabez wanting to know God more. They took it as Jabez wanted a bunch of stuff. So if we pray the prayer that Jabez, this, we're going to get a bunch of stuff. And people jumped on that and 
went after it and some got blessed and some got disappointed. You can't just get caught by any wind that blows by. You got to be watchful, man. Sometimes distractions are unavoidable. The stress of life, hard situations, pain, sickness, whatever. But the most important thing you got to do is you got to stay focused on Christ. But let me hear that finally. The last thing you have to do is be thankful. Well, I don't have anything to be thankful about. I do. I was a sinner saved by grace. I was lost, but now I found. I was blind, but now I see. I'm thankful, man. I could live in a hole in the wall and still be thankful. But you're like, but you don't live in a hole in a wall. You have a house. You just don't understand something, man. I don't give a rip about my house. I built it, and I don't give a rip about my house. You know what I'm thankful for? I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm lost. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You got to be thankful, bro. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you some more for all that you have done. So gracious, so merciful, so thankful, Lord. And today, Lord Jesus, we come to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We ask God that it would, re it would reveal things in our heart and lives that needs to be adjusted and changed, whatever it takes, so that, Lord, we might draw near to you. I pray today, Father, for every life that's here. That God, that every person would get to that place where they could say that they were a sinner saved by grace. That they were lost, but now they're found. They were blind, but now they see. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your spirit would go across this place, touching every life and heart. With your heads bowed for just a moment, your eyes closed, and we do this every week. If you want to know Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior, if you want to have him come in and change who you are, I want to pray for you. And I'm going to stay right where I'm at, and you're going to stay where you're at. But if you want to pray, if you want me to lead you in a prayer, I'm going to ask you to look at me in just a moment. And once I see your eyes, you can close your eyes, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Starting on my left, you want to pray that to know Christ? Look at me right now. Sure. Any more? Got him. Cool. Got him. My right. You want to know Christ? I'll pray for you. All I got to see is your eyes. Sure. Any more? Got it. Pray this from your heart. Lord Jesus, I do come to you today surrendering my life, giving you my all, asking for your forgiveness, and yet, Lord, giving you my life. I pray that you come into my life, Lord Jesus. I accept you, Lord. I need you, Lord. And I receive you, Lord, as my Savior. Here I am, Father. Take me and use me. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, I'm grateful for those who prayed their prayer today. Touch their lives, change their lives. Grow us, Lord. But for every heart and life here today, God, let us just not exist. But Lord, let us, let this body live out a faith that's alive and well. And may we go after you, Lord, with everything inside of us. Why don't you all stand? If you'd like prayer this morning about it.